last time we did a quick overview about three layers of probability. If someone comes up to me and asks about uh, Christianity, I don't start at the very top. I don't say, look, here's the deal. I don't give a four-hour conversation. I always start where they're at. But if someone said start from scratch, this is my presentation. That's why this whole study is from scratch. And so when I think about it from scratch, I think of three layers of probability, as I told about. This is my way of doing it. Quite probable, very probable, virtually certain. And so step number one is things like saying things that point to God. Fine, they point to God. And so I think there are about nine or ten things that point to God, for which God is the best explanation. I don't think God is the only explanation for these things. I think he's the best explanation for these things. If you want the handout for this, I forgot to say this, uh, keep forgetting to say it, the digital version of this, you can get it as well on the website. If you go to, at the top, drop down ministries, then go to local and global outreach. Ministries, local and global outreach. And you'll see it about a fourth way down the page. It'll talk about this study. There's a link that says to download the study, click here or handout or something like that. So ministries, local and global outreach. Okay, so I have pointed to things. These things point to God. So these are facts about reality. Not just all science, but facts of reality that point to God. I say that I think God is the best explanation why anything exists. It's a great question to ask. Why does anything exist whatsoever? All of existence exists because it either has to be here, it's necessary, or it's contingent. That is, something else brought it along. I think the universe is contingent. Virtually everyone does. Even if you thought the universe was eternal, you're still going to ask the question, hello, you're still going to ask the question, why is it here? It's a fair question. If someone says, that's a dumb question, well, I disagree. I want to ask the question, why is there something, rather than nothing at all? I think God's the best explanation. Some kind of powerful being, I think, brought into existence. I, I think the, why the universe had a beginning. Virtu virtually every scientist concurs it had a beginning, and um, it does, it did. And even if there's a multiverse, which I didn't talk a lot about here because it's not a study on that. Even if there are a multiverse, there's one universe bubbling up, it still had a beginning. Uh, multiple formulas demonstrate that. If something comes into being, I'm going to ask what caused it. And we talk about those arguments. So I think God is the best explanation why the universe came into being in the first place. I think God is the best explanation why the universe has certain laws, constants, and quantities that are fine-tuned precisely for life to develop. So things like the law of gravity, the force of gravity, the actual force of it um, is independent of the universe. So why is it fine-tuned just right, mixed with, you know, and as far as we can tell, last I looked, they were close to 100. It's probably more by now. The strong and weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, the, the expansion rate of the universe, all these exact constant quantities had to be just right as soon as the universe began. It didn't come to that place. It, it was there. And this is not a religious term. Fine-tuning is not a religious term at all. They have huge uh, conferences where atheist scientists get together and talk about the fine-tuning of the universe. The question is, why is it fine-tuned? And notice I said for life. This is all re repeat for those of you who were here last time or watched online. I didn't say for human life. I didn't say for human species. I said for life. If these constants and quantities were not fine-tuned just right, uh, stars would not have form formed. We're not talking about us as being special. This has nothing to do with human life. We're just part of life. We're talking about life in general. We're never, molecules never form correctly. Uh, so I ask the question, I think God's the best explanation of why the universe is fine-tuned for life. I think God's the best explanation of why there are laws of nature. Now that's where we pause. I want to start on uh, number four, which is on your handout, page four. Is that right? Page yeah. four on your handout? Okay. Laws of nature. A law of nature... And I'm going to go this, the, the rest of this goes pretty quickly. I'll slow down the moral argument. Uh, a law in science is just shorthand for a something that happens a lot. So a behavior that typically repeats itself. That's it, a behavior that typically repeats itself. Laws are not immutable, unchanging things. It's just a way of saying something repeats itself. They're patterns, which means that's all. So laws cannot, you'll hear people say this, they're just mistaken. Laws cannot create things. Laws cannot cause things. Stephen Hawking, the guy who was in the wheelchair and brilliant genius, all that stuff in his book, he said because of the law, because of quantum physics, 
and the laws of gravity, we know that universes can come from nothing. No, and this is one of the, that book has been critiqued by many people. No, they do not. Gravity does not cause anything. And quantum field also doesn't cause it either, which we talked about. All of you remember your quantum mechanics? Do you remember that very well? We cover that? Nobody? Okay, I'm sorry to hear that because we covered it very in depth. We had a long video. I'm just kidding, like a minute. Did you see that online? Uh, so, all right, my favorite part of the whole study, no one remembers it. I'm just kidding. So, I brought that up just because if some of you ever really dialogued with an atheist, they say, no, 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 that's dumb. Well, you know, that's stupid because. The universe popped into being from nothing. It happens all the time in the quantum field. I showed a minute and a half video saying, no, it does not. Things do not pop in from nothing in the quantum field. The quantum field is a thing, not a no thing. It's a sea of energy. That's all it is. So universe is, anyway, that's, I talked about that. Okay. Even the quantum realm is governed by laws, but laws don't cause things. Law doesn't. Um, they might explain an event, like what is a waterfall? Well, the laws of gravity, or water comes over the edge of something, it didn't create a waterfall. It didn't create the water. It's a way to explain why the water is coming toward the earth, as far as we can tell. You know, that's what gravity is. Does that make sense so far? That's all laws are. So, but laws exist. They exist. They're a fact of reality. Now, here's the deal. So that's what a law is. So you'll hear, you hear atheists, you'll hear naturalists, that all that exists is matter and energy. They'll talk with high, lofty talk about laws, like Stephen Hawking, laws bring things to existence. Um, that, that's mistaken. But here's the deal. Theism, Christian theism, that's a worldview. I'm a Christian theist. I believe there's an all-powerful creator God who is not part of creation, no more than a, a potter is made of clay. No, no, no. He created the universe. Theism does not tell me what the laws of nature are going to be. They won't tell me that. There's no Bible verse. There's no Christian reflection we've paused for a long time since god exists i bet there's something called the law of quantum blah blah mm. and i bet it's in this exact force it doesn't happen that way theism does not tell us what the laws of nature are we need science for that we need to study observe things and go look at there i dropped this apple over and over and over it's isaac newton whatever you know and we start to no we're not we're still not sure what gravity is exactly but nevertheless we observe it over and over and over and over and that's basically science yeah so ryan irving asks Quantum Leap, question mark? <laughs> Ryan Irving asked about Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap, that was an underrated show. That was such a good... Uh, that's You know, let's pause for a while and, and reflect <laughs> on the goodness of Quantum Leap. That was really good. Now, for, for real, I was going to say this. I'm glad it's watching online. I want y'all to know I try to praise people as much as I can when I think... I mean, people are awesome, but... Ryan, Ryan Irving, who's, the now the, who's a deacon now, and he's the facilities manager of the church has done so much and the deacons have ryan has served the hours people don't see how much the cafe he did every almost every bit of it all the lighting is i mean he's just now other people help but the amount of time he has spent that and our home he's come to our house and, and served he can do just about anything with let he's electric and whiz and i mean he's just been a servant i'm so very 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 grateful uh, for him, so I want y'all to hear that we've we've got a lot of great servants and good people here at the church, and he's one of them. I mean, just a solid guy. So I'm, I appreciate him so very much. Um, speaking of quantum leap, and Ryan Irving. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't mean to do that. Back up. Okay. Okay. Here's the deal. Christian theism does not tell us what laws of nature should be. Naturalism doesn't either. That's the other worldview. Remember, I'll keep saying this to my nosebleeds. It's not. Christianity versus science. That doesn't make any sense. The science is short for the scientific method. Or maybe the knowledge you get from the scientific method. That's not against each other. Christianity would be against naturalism. Those are both worldviews. Naturalism, as we talked about, is that all that exists is matter and energy. Okay? But that doesn't tell us what the laws of nature are either. So those worldviews do not help us. We need the scientific method to determine what they are. So... If science says, I discovered a new law, and here's how strong it is, then they go, see, I told you God does exist. It doesn't follow at all. That doesn't make any sense. See, I told you naturalism is true. That doesn't make any sense. You can't say I discovered gravity, therefore I know all that exists is matter and energy. That's naturalism. That doesn't follow at all. Do you understand that, basically? So if discovering a law of nature 
does not make naturalism true, makes the scientific method a good method. Wonderful. On naturalism, there is no explanation at all for why there are laws of nature. Zero. Now, they're hopeful. They'll say this. We're hopeful. We're not going to be like you lazy, stupid Christians who give up all of a sudden. We're going to, we're going to wait for centuries. We're going to figure out why there's such things called laws of nature. They have no clue. In Christian theism, the laws of nature are just a description of how God governs the universe. These are the way God governs the universe. And Jeremiah 33, 25, Jeremiah 33, 25 says this, this is the NET translation. Jeremiah 33, 25 says this, but I, the Lord, make the following promise. I have made a covenant governing the coming of day and night. I have established the fixed laws governing heaven and earth. So it's a basic belief in Judaism and Christianity and Islam <clears throat> that the laws of nature are God's governing the universe. And what's so important right now is that's on Christian theism. But my point right now is very important is that they don't cause anything. They're just behavior. Now, here's a quick video by Lewis reflecting on this. And it's worth just a few the minutes. The laws of nature. Just a few minutes. By C.S. Lewis. Poor woman, said my friend. One hardly knows what to say when they talk like that. She thinks her son survived on him because she prayed for him. It would be heartless to explain to her that he really survived because he was a little to the left or a little to the right of some bullet. That bullet was following a course laid down by the laws of nature. It couldn't have hit him. He just happened to be standing off its line. And so all day long, as regards every bullet and every splinter of shell, his survival was simply due to the laws of nature. At that moment, my first pupil came in, and the conversation was cut short. But later in the day, I had to walk across the park to a committee meeting, and this gave me time to think the matter over. It was quite clear that once a bullet had been fired from point A in direction B, the wind being C, and so forth, it would pursue a certain path. But might our young friend have been standing somewhere else? And might the German have fired at a different moment or in a different direction? If men have free will, it would appear that they might. On that view, we get a rather more complicated picture of the Battle of Arnhem. The total course of events would be a kind of amalgam derived from two sources. On the one hand, from acts of human will, which might presumably have been otherwise, and on the other, from the laws of physical nature. And this would seem to provide all that is necessary for the mother's belief that her prayers had some place among the causes of her son's preservation. God might continually influence the wills of all the combatants so as to allot death, wounds, and survival in the way he thought best, while leaving the behavior of the projectile to follow its normal course. But I was still not quite clear about the physical side of this picture. I had been thinking, vaguely enough, that the bullet's flight was caused by the laws of nature. But is this really so? Granted that the bullet is set in motion, and granted the wind and the Earth's gravitation and all the other relevant factors, then it is a law of nature that the bullet must take the course it did. But then the pressing of the trigger, the side wind, and even the Earth are not exactly laws. They are facts or events. They are not laws, but things that obey laws. Obviously, to consider the pressing of the trigger would only lead us back to the free will side of the picture. We must, therefore, choose a simpler example. The laws of physics, I understand, decree that when one billiard ball, A, sets another billiard ball, B, in motion, the momentum lost by A exactly equals the momentum gained by B. This is a law. That is, this is the pattern to which the movement of the two billiard balls must conform, provided, of course, that something sets ball A in motion. And here comes the snag. The law won't set it in motion. It is usually a man with a cue who does that. But a man with a cue would send us back to free will. So let us assume that it was lying on a table in a liner, and that what set it in motion was a lurch of the ship. In that case, it was not the law which produced the movement, it was a wave. And that wave, though it certainly moved according to the laws of physics, was not moved by them. It was shocked by other waves, and by winds, and so forth. And however far you traced the story back, you would never find the laws of nature causing anything. The dazzlingly obvious conclusion now arose in my mind. 
In the whole history of the universe, the laws of nature have never produced a single event. They are the patterns to which every event must conform, provided only that it can be induced to happen. But how do you get it to do that? How do you get a move on? The laws of nature can give you no help there. All events obey them, just as all operations with money obey the laws of arithmetic. Add six pennies to six, and the result will certainly be a shilling. But arithmetic by itself won't put one farthing into your pocket. Up till now, I had had a vague idea that the laws of nature could make things happen. I now saw that this was exactly like thinking that you could increase your income by doing sums about it. The laws are the pattern to which events conform. The source of events must be sought elsewhere. This may be put in the form that the laws of nature explain everything except the source of events. But this is rather a formidable exception. The laws, in one sense, cover the whole of reality except, well, except that continuous cataract of real events which makes up the actual universe. They explain everything except what we should ordinarily call everything. The only thing they omit is the whole universe. I do not mean that a knowledge of these laws is useless. Provided we can take over the actual universe as a going concern, such knowledge is useful and indeed indispensable for manipulating it. Just as, if only you have some money, arithmetic is indispensable for managing it. But the events themselves, the money itself, that is quite another affair. Where then do actual events come from? In one sense the answer is easy. Each event comes from a previous event. But what happens if you trace this process backwards? To ask this is not exactly the same as to ask where things come from, how there came to be space and time and matter at all. Our present problem is not about things, but about events. Not, for example, about particles of matter, but about this particle colliding with that. The mind can perhaps acquiesce in the idea that the properties of the universal drama somehow just happen to be there. But whence comes the play, the story? Either the stream of events had a beginning or it had not. If it had, then we are faced with something like creation. If it had not, a supposition by the way which some physicists find difficult, then we are faced with an everlasting impulse which, by its very nature, is opaque to scientific thought. Science, when it becomes perfect, will have explained the connection between each link in the chain and the link before it. But the actual existence of the chain will remain wholly unaccountable. We learn more and more about the pattern. We learn nothing about that which feeds real events into the pattern. If it is not God, we must at the very least call it destiny, the immaterial ultimate one-way pressure which keeps the universe on the move. The smallest event then, if we face the fact that it occurs, instead of concentrating on the pattern into which, if it can be persuaded to occur, it must fit, leads us back to a mystery which lies outside natural science. It is certainly a possible supposition that behind this mystery some mighty will and life is at work. If so, any contrast between his acts and the laws of nature is out of the question. It is his act alone that gives the laws any events to apply to. The laws are an empty frame. It is he who fills that frame. Not now and then, on specially providential occasions, but at every moment. And he, from his vantage point above time, can, if he pleases, take all prayers into account in ordaining that vast complex event which is the history of the universe. For what we call future prayers have always been present to him. And he has a long section about that. So the universe... I mean, the laws of nature exist. They don't cause anything. They don't create anything. We can ask the question, why are the laws of nature? Any questions or comments about that? So I think God governs the universe by these laws. That's a standard view amongst Christian thinkers. Why the universe? Number five, I think God's the best explanation for why the universe is what we call rational. It comports or fits with mathematics perfectly. Now, there are multiple theories in the philosophy of mathematics. Almost all the scientists I've read and heard don't think that mathematics, the actual formulas that mathematicians use, are a useful fiction, but a real insight into the character, you might say, the workings of the universe. 
And that's what's so staggering. And I, I, I was going to put a bunch of quotes on all these things, but it would take it'd be like a 12-week session. Mm -hmm. uh, in my book, I have more quotes. But scientists talk a lot about how it is amazing that the more mathematicians, pure mathematicians, just use math to determine how things should be, how often that comports with the universe. For example, Einstein's equations were confirmed years after he had the equations, but now they're completely confirmed. He didn't use a telescope. He didn't use a microscope. The math itself said if this is true, and then this is true, and this is true, leads to it. So I'll move on quickly, but this is amazing how much math rationally comports to it. There, there needs to be an explanation for that. I think God's the best explanation. Uh, number six, I think why there's information in the cell. Now, if you like, you may like biology. Anyone here at all like biology at all? No, oh, thank you, Julia. Appreciate that. Yeah. Inside of every cell, all right, it's DNA. DNA is the hereditary material in almost all living organisms. And nearly every cell in your body has DNA. Most of it's in a cell nucleus. Some can be other places. I'm not going to so much time on that. But the information in the, is, in DNA is stored as code made of four chemicals. We'll talk about that in a second. Human DNA consists of about three billion bases, those four letters, three billion combinations of that. And more than 99% of those bases are the same in all people. More than 99% of all those bases are identical in all human beings. We're under 1% different, you and I, biologically speaking, biologically. The order or the exact sequence of these bases, those four letters, and we'll see those four chemical bases, the exact sequence determines the information available for building and maintaining an organism. Like the letters of an alphabet appear in certain order to form words and sentences. They have to be in just right order. You can't say jub -dub 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 and go, yeah, there's a sentence. That had to be in the right sequence to convey information. Just, uh, listen to this, just over three billion base pairs or 1.5 gigabytes of information are in one chromosome. Estimates for the number of cells in the human body range between 10 trillion and 100 trillion. So let's take 100 trillion cells as a generally accepted estimate, close to 100 trillion cells in eight, one human. Some of us have more cells than others, depending on your weight. So given that each Diploid cell contains 1.5 gigabytes of data. The approximate amount of data stored in the human body is around 150 trillion gigabytes. If you're not a nerd and no science, that's a lot of gigabytes. A hundred estimate, 150 trillion gigabytes of information are in you. Uh, it was Richard Dawkins, the great atheist, who uh, one amoeba, an amoeba. If I recall, it's around 200 million uh, uh, gig amounts of information in it. Since life depends on the presence of the genetic information, any theory of the origin of life, the first life, must provide an account of the origin of that information. As an origin of life researcher, Bernd Olaf Kuppers has explained, the problem of the origin of life is clearly basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information. That's it. You're looking for deep. Looking for, why is there information building block? Why is there um, a, a, a Bill, a Bill Gates, of course, the founder of Microsoft? That's what he calls DNA. He said it's it's the most complex uh, manual. I don't know the exact word to use. The basic manual ever written. Now, this is a quick video about DNA and what it is, and we're talking about information. If you haven't learned this before, this is really fascinating. Kids pay Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called the nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. 
The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. The protein has to be folded to that exact shape or it does not function. You cannot just throw a bunch of letters at it and hope that it just folds correctly. It's got to be in the exact right spot. There are about 23 proteins and then they have to form just right to form the cell. At all the basic level is the DNA is a manual of how the exact basis should form to form this, to form this, to form this, to form the protein. And that's information. So that's the question. Now, there's so much here. I think on your handout, I give you all kinds of books you can read um, that are really good about all these things. So I'm going to move on about that. But this, this is an amazing amount of DNA and information in the person. Information, in my understanding, always comes from a mind. And I, it's curious to... I've listened to many discussions. I've read books on this to uh, biologists that say, you know, where does it come from? They have no idea. They'll say, we're getting close. We're getting close. I've heard the discussion. So far, and I'm... I'm not a biologist, but I can't find any answer that actually sounds like it's close at all. Some say, well, the, and look, back in the 50s, there was an experiment done. This shows, I might still show up in books sometimes, biology books. I can't remember the name of the study. I'm sorry. It's a well-known study where the guy apparently recreated the events in the origin, you know, five billion years ago and said it worked. That's been debunked for a long time. You'll still hear people, you'll see it in textbooks. The actual conditions of Earth when life probably originally formed, were overwhelmingly hostile. The, the amount of, of um, uh, ammonia in the air and the, the chemicals in the air at the time the Earth was formed, which we ex scientists think when DNA first started, the origin of life, almost everything about the Earth was hostile to life. So it, should, it makes it extreme. It's different from this beautiful Hawaiian looking, you know, beautiful waterfalls and there's some kind of perfect pool of perfect, no, everything about it wanted to die. And then all the time it happened at one time, I had to multiply just right with information. It's different from saying, if I got Lane's building blocks and I don't have time, but we could do, I thought about these examples I, when I taught my kids, you can get the building blocks with the different letters on it. Like we have a home that says 23 days to Christmas, whatever. If you got all those letters and just threw them on the ground, if you threw them on the ground and they formed a paragraph, wow. <laughs> That's what you need DNA to do. You need to take all these bases inside the human body and throw them on the ground and they fit perfectly. Over and over and over again. So there's that people say that the general explanation by an atheist or not a naturalist is going to say is, we don't know yet, we'll figure it out, stop being lazy. The theist says, we think information always comes from mind. You'll never explain it. I think God's the best explanation for it. Any questions or comments about that? Now that you're biologist and quantum mechanics specialist? Okay. All right. Number seven. I think God's the best explanation for why they're objective moral values. This is usually the part of the study where people start going, now I understand what David's saying. He begins to speak English now. I'm sorry if you don't like science, but I, this is the best I can do with my study. I think there are such things as objective moral values and duties. 
Objective, mor objective morality, David, what is that? What do you mean by objective? I don't mean universal. Objective means morality that is true, independent of personal opinion. It's true, independent of personal subjective opinion. It means morality is not a preference, but a statement of fact about something. It's objective. It's a statement about a fact of something. Like, it's a, I, when I say this orange table exists, it's right there. I'm just giving objective fact. Now, I might be wrong, but it's true or false. I'm not saying I like orange tables. I said there is an orange table. So when I say there are objective moral values, I think they actually really exist regardless of your preference for them or not. I think they really exist. That is, they're real. They're real. Most people think that. But, for example, it's not, I personally don't like, I personally don't prefer torturing babies for fun, but that's just my opinion. Instead, humans around the world would concur. It's immoral. It's immoral and despicable to torture babies for fun. I don't care who you are. I don't care if they lined up 7 billion people and said, no, it's a good thing. You're wrong. You're all mistaken. You've gone crazy. That is wrong. Uh, as Bill Craig says often, it would mean that if had Hitler won, Nazis took over all of Europe and even all of Russia, they would still have been wrong that Jews should have been murdered and that there's some subclass. The power doesn't make it right and the majority of the view doesn't make it right. Now, this to me is by far one of the most persuasive arguments conceivable before I get to the Jesus part. When I get to the New Testament, I'm, I'm more a historian by heart. I'm not a philosopher by heart, for sure. Um, I'm a wannabe scientist, but I'm a historian by heart, theologian by heart. That is most compelling. But on this probable outer circle for me, this is by far the most persuasive. Because it, to me, it's so overwhelmingly obvious all humans besides those with serious psychological disorders apprehend a moral law we all do asians do mexicans do canadians do even canadians <laughs> uh, people in chicago do if you can believe that they all believe there's an intuitive compulsion to do the right thing it's an ought uh, it's universally apprehended almost and that, besides people with disorders, it feels like a commandment. It's so universally apprehended, if I use it in quotation marks, that, again, if you do not apprehend that, you have one of two serious psychological disorders. And I, I, mean, I would say this in a live debate with a billion people listening. If, if you do not think objective moral values, if you really do not think they exist, you genuinely should walk to the closest police department and tell them that. You probably suffer from either two, one of two, you're psychopathy or sociopathy. These are antisocial, particularly sociopathy. You either do not apprehend them or you don't feel any kind of compunction when you break them. You are a danger to society. You are a danger to society. Society works because every single, virtually, on the planet knows there's such thing as moral values and laws. Now, remember, why is the moral law universal? Why does it feel like the commandment? Why is it everybody feels it, and why does it feel like we ought to do something? Now, I'm going to talk about more of that in a little bit. Now, I'm going to show these two good videos because this is the intro to C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And this is classic, classic uh, argument for Lewis. I think he does a fantastic job. The stuff you watch so far is a little more specific, a little more scholarly. This, he says, uh, for the most broadest audience possible. It's well worth your time. It's a few minutes on this moral law. I hope that hearing this and seeing these videos will help you remember it. If you ever talk to a person, you talk about, I think there's some things in moral law. Uh, hopefully these, these videos will help draw to your attention what we're talking about. C.S. Lewis gave these talks. He was asked to do these talks on BBC America, uh, BBC in, in Europe there during World War II. So this is one part. When we are beset of sin, 
Lange skal vi flytte hjem. Tonight, the BBC presents the first in a series of talks called Right and Wrong, a clue to the meaning of the universe by C.S. Lewis. This talk is titled Common Decency. And now, Mr. Lewis. Good evening. Everyone has heard people quarrelling. That's not really Lewis talking. Sometimes it sounds funny and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kinds of things they say. They say things like this. How do you like it if anyone did the same to you? <laughs> That's my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove him first? Give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day. Educated people as well as uneducated. And children as well as grown-ups. Now what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior doesn't happen to please him. He's appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out that what he's been doing doesn't really go against the standard. Or that if it does, there is some special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first shouldn't keep it. Or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of orange. Or that something has turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it about which they really agreed. And they have. If they hadn't, they might, of course, fight like animals, but they couldn't quarrel in the human sense of the word. Quarrelling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong. And there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and he had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are. Just as there'd be no sense in saying that a footballer had committed a foul unless there are some agreement about the rules of football. Now this law, or rule, about right and wrong used to be called the law of nature. Nowadays, when we talk of the laws of nature, we usually mean things like gravitation, or heredity, or the laws of chemistry. But when the older thinkers called the law of right and wrong the law of nature, they really meant the law of human nature. The idea was that just as falling stones are governed by the law of gravitation and chemicals by chemical laws, so the creature called man also had his law, with this great difference, that the stone couldn't choose whether it obeyed the law of gravitation or not, but a man could choose either to obey the law of human nature or to disobey it. They called it law of nature because they thought that everyone knew it by nature and didn't need to be taught it. They didn't mean, of course, that you might find an odd individual here and there who didn't know it, just as you find a few people who are colorblind or have no ear for a tune. But taking the race as a whole, they thought that the human idea of decent behavior was obvious to everyone. And I believe they were right. If they were not, then all the things we say about the war are nonsense. What is the sense in saying the enemy is in the wrong, unless right is a real thing, which the Germans at bottom know as well as we do? and ought to practice. If they have no notion of what we mean by right, and though we might still have to fight them, we could no more blame them for that than for the color of their hair. I know that some people say the idea of a law of nature or decent behavior known to all men is unsound because different civilizations and different ages have had quite different moralities. But this is not true. They have only had slightly different moralities. Just think what a quite different morality would mean. Think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, 
or when a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. Men have differed as regards what people you ought to be unselfish to, whether it was only your own family or your fellow countrymen or everyone. But they have always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. Selfishness has never been admired. Men have differed as to whether you should have one wife or four, but they have always agreed that you must not simply have any woman you liked. But the most remarkable thing is this. Whenever you find a man who says he does not believe in a real right and wrong, you will find the same man going back on this a moment later. He may break his promise to you, but if you try breaking one to him, he will be complaining it's not fair before you can say Jack Robinson. A nation may say treaties don't matter, but then next minute they spoil their case by saying that the particular treaty they want to break was an unfair one. But if treaties don't matter, and if there is no such thing as right and wrong, in other words, if there is no law of nature, what is the difference between a fair treaty and an unfair one? Have they not let the cat out of the bag and shown that whatever they say, they really know the law of nature, just like anyone else? It seems then, we are forced to believe in a real right and wrong. People may be sometimes mistaken about them, just as people sometimes get their sums wrong, but they are not a matter of mere taste and opinion, any more than the multiplication table. Now, if we're agreed about that, I go on to my next point, which is this. None of us are really keeping the law of nature. If there are any exceptions among you, I apologize to them. They'd much better switch to some other station, for nothing I am going to say concerns them. And now, turning to the ordinary human beings who are left, I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to say. I'm not preaching, and heaven knows I don't pretend to be better than anyone else. I am only trying to call attention to a fact. The fact that this year, or this month, or more likely this very day, we have failed to practice ourselves the kind of behavior we expect from other people. There may be all sorts of excuses for us. That time you were so unfair to the children was when you were very tired. That slightly shady business about the money, the one you've almost forgotten came when you were very hard up and what you promised to do for old so-and-so we'll pause it real quickly because that's that's so good but that's such a good, very very important point he said that we all maybe this year this month this day have failed to keep the law that we expect everyone else to obey we have failed to, everyone else to obey but when we fail it we make an excuse for it but we still expect everybody else to obey it. That's exactly right. That's such good stuff. And of course, you hope you hear his point. The fact that we all do that means we're appealing to something outside of us, some kind of moral law, and we assume the other person should know the law we hold them to. You have never done well. You never would have promised if you had known how frightfully busy you were going to be. And as for your behavior to your wife, or husband, or sister, or brother. If I knew how irritating they could be, mm. I wouldn't wonder at it. Mm. And who the dickens am I anyway? I'm just the same. Mm. That is to say, I don't succeed in keeping the law of nature very well. And the moment anyone tells me I'm not keeping it, there starts up in my mind a string of excuses mm. as long as you're on. The question at the moment isn't whether they are good excuses. The point is that they are one more proof of how deeply, whether we like it or not, we believe in the law of nature. If we don't believe in decent behavior, why should we be so anxious to make excuses for not having behaved decently? The truth is, we believe in decency so much we feel the rule or law pressing on us so that we can't bear to face the fact that we're breaking it, and consequently we try to shift the responsibility. 
For you'll notice that it is only for our bad behavior that we find all these explanations. It is only our bad temper that we put down to being tired or worried or hungry. We put our good temper down to ourselves. These then are the first two points I wanted to make tonight. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they don't in fact behave in that way. They know the law of nature, they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. All clear Thank you. All clear thinking. I cannot concur more. I, that helped change my way of understanding people forever when I first read that back in the original, uh, of course, the book. Any questions or comments about that point he's making there or the points he's making there? I think about this very often while you're thinking of things, looking online too, someone says a thing. When I watch people on the news, when I watch people, when I hear songs, movies, good night, be kind to everyone. Mm -hmm. The good news at the end of the news. Yeah, there's always the good news. Nice be to nice to each other. Mm -hmm. No one goes, who are you to shove your morality down my throat? That's all, and I'll come up in a second a little I'm going to talk about evolution, and so we'll talk about some rejoinders to this at first. But I'll have to say, we hear this all the time. I used to tell my students yeah. when I taught at high school, I said, to test this theory to see if it's more law, go to the next time, uh, go to a restaurant, uh, you know, Taco Bell, whatever it is, and just jump in line, see what happens. And when they go, what? And they get mad, look at them and say, what? Act like there's nothing wrong whatsoever. And see, what, see if the whole group agrees with you. No one does that. Everyone gets ticked off because you're not supposed to respect the rules. It's not right. My children did not have to be taught this at all. They had a deep, deep sense of justice Julia. early on. Julia I was, was the worst. That, uh, that's what I was going to say. Working with young children, I mean, yeah. you see this initially. They don't use words, but they'll, if they take a toy, they think it's okay. But if somebody took a toy from them, they're in tears. I mean, there's this there's, it's, it shows that they understand there's, I mean, you have to teach certain things and yeah. manners and such, but they understand that this is not okay. This is okay. There's, it's like built in them. Yeah. And I will talk, that's exactly true. So Elaine, we talk about this very often. We have talked about it often about seeing it children from early, a lot of stuff like understanding the difference between gender and morality and so forth. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second, um, in a second. So, and this is a quick video about some of, does that make sense? Any questions or comments so far? Anything at all? Here's a quick video on some objections to that he gave following that. And this is, this is really good. Here. Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. The reality of the moral law. This is just quick real quick. I now go back to what I said at the end of the first talk, that there were two odd things about the human race. First, that they were haunted by the idea of a sort of behavior they ought to practice, what you might call fair play, or decency, or morality, or the law of nature. Second, that they did not, in fact, do so. Now, some of you may wonder why I call this odd. It may seem to you the most natural thing in the world. In particular, you may have thought I was rather hard on the human race. After all, you may say, what I call breaking the law of right and wrong, or of nature, only means that people are not perfect. And why on earth should I expect them to be? That would be a good answer if what I was trying to do was to fix the exact amount of blame which is due to us for not behaving as we expect others to behave. But that is not my job at all. I am not concerned at present with blame. I am trying to find out truth. And from that point of view, the very idea of something being imperfect, of its not being what it ought to be, has certain consequences. If you take a thing like a stone or a tree, it is what it is, and there seems no sense in saying it ought to have been otherwise. Of course, you may say a stone is the wrong shape if you want to use it for a rockery, or that a tree is a bad tree because it does not give you as much shade as you expected. But all you mean is that the stone or tree does not happen to be convenient for some purpose of your own. 
You are not, except as a joke, blaming them for that. You really know that given the weather and the soil, the tree could not have been any different. What we, from our point of view, call a bad tree is obeying the laws of its nature just as much as a good one. Now, have you noticed what follows? It follows that what we usually call the laws of nature, the way weather works on a tree, for example, may not really be laws in the strict sense, but only in a manner of speaking. When you say that falling stones always obey the law of gravitation, is not this much the same as saying that the law only means what stones always do? You do not really think that when a stone is let go, it suddenly remembers that it is under orders to fall to the ground. You only mean that, in fact, it does fall. In other words, you cannot be sure that there is anything over and above the facts themselves, any law about what ought to happen, as distinct from what does happen. The laws of nature, as applied to stones or trees, may only mean what nature, in fact, does. But if you turn to the law of human nature, the law of decent behavior, it is a different matter. Yes. That law certainly does not mean what human beings in fact do. For, as I said before, <coughs> many of them do not obey this law at all, and none of them obey it completely. The law of gravity tells you what stones do if you drop them, but the law of human nature tells you what human beings ought to do and do not. In other words, when you are dealing with humans, something else comes in above and beyond the actual facts. You have the facts, how men do behave, and you also have something else, how they ought to behave. In the rest of the universe, there need not be anything but the facts. Electrons and molecules behave in a certain way, and certain results follow, and that may be the whole story. As a footnote, I do not think it is the whole story, as you will see later. I mean that as far as the argument has gone up to date, it may be. But men behave in a certain way, and that is not the whole story. For all the time, you know that they ought to behave differently. Now this is really so peculiar that one is tempted to try to explain it away. For instance, we might try to make out that when you say a man ought not to act as he does, you only mean the same as when you say that a stone is the wrong shape, namely that what he is doing happens to be inconvenient to you. But that is simply untrue. A man occupying the corner seat in the train because he got there first and a man who slipped into it while my back was turned and removed my bag are both equally inconvenient, but I blame the second man and do not blame the first. I am not angry, except perhaps for a moment before I come to my senses, with a man who trips me up by accident. I am angry with a man who tries to trip me up even if he does not succeed. Yet the first has hurt me and the second has not. Sometimes the behavior which I call bad is not inconvenient to me at all, but the very opposite. In war, each side may find a traitor on the other side very useful. But though they use him and pay him, they regard him as human vermin. So you cannot say that what we call decent behavior in others is simply the behavior that happens to be useful to us. And as for decent behavior in ourselves, I suppose it is pretty obvious that it does not mean the behavior that pays. It means things like being content with 30 shillings when you might have got three pounds, doing schoolwork honestly when it would be easy to cheat, leaving a girl alone when you would like to make love to her, staying in dangerous places when you could go somewhere safer, keeping promises you would rather not keep, and telling the truth even when it makes you look a fool. Some people say that though decent conduct does not mean what pays each particular person at a particular moment, still it means what pays the human race as a whole, and that consequently there is no mystery about it. Very human beings, after all, have some sense. They see that you cannot have any real safety or happiness except in a society where everyone plays fair, and it is because they see this 
that they try to behave decently. Now, of course, it is perfectly true that safety and happiness can only come from individuals, classes and nations being honest and fair and kind to each other. It is one of the most important truths in the world. But as an explanation of why we feel as we do about right and wrong, it just misses the point. If we ask, why ought I to be unselfish? And you reply, because it is good for society. We may then ask, why should I care what's good for society except when it happens to pay me personally? And then you will have to say, because you ought to be unselfish, which simply brings us back to where we started. You are saying what is true, but you are not getting any further. If a man asked what was the point of playing football, it would not be much good saying in order to score goals, for trying to score goals is the game itself, not the reason for the game. And you would really only be saying that football was football, which is true, but not worth saying. In the same way, if a man asks, what is the point of behaving decently, it is no good replying, in order to benefit society. For trying to benefit society, in other words, being unselfish, for society, after all, only means other people, is one of the things decent behavior consists in. All you are really saying is that decent behavior is decent behavior. You would have said just as much if you had stopped at the statement, men ought to be unselfish. And that is where I do stop. Men ought to be unselfish, ought to be fair. Not that men are unselfish, nor that they like being unselfish, but that they ought to be. The moral law, or law of human nature, is not simply a fact about human behavior in the same way as the law of gravitation is, or may be simply a fact about how heavy objects behave. On the other hand, it is not a mere fancy, for we cannot get rid of the idea, and most of the things we say and think about men would be reduced to nonsense if we did. And it is not simply a statement about how we should like men to behave for our own convenience. For the behavior we call bad or unfair is not exactly the same as the behavior we find inconvenient and may even be the opposite. Consequently, this rule of right and wrong or law of human nature or whatever you call it must somehow or other be a real thing. A thing that is really there, not made up by ourselves. And yet it is not a fact in the ordinary sense, in the same way as our actual behavior is a fact. It begins to look as if we shall have to admit that there is more than one kind of reality. That in this particular case, there is something above and beyond the ordinary facts of men's behavior, and yet quite definitely real a real law, which none of us made, but which we find pressing on us. Any questions or comments about that? No? None online either? She's not looking. Mm -hmm. The second explanation he gave that people do this because it's really just, it's good for society as a whole, that's the most popular one I've ever heard because that flows out of evolution. And he already explained how that doesn't work at all. Now, many atheists act as if there are objective moral values. They act like there are. This is why so many atheists would never murder an innocent person even though they're atheists. It's just that there's no reason whatsoever to ground morality in naturalism. So they act like there is, and I'm glad they do. There's no reason to act like there is, if naturalism is true. Morality is simply, and they're, in naturalism, if all that exists are matter and energy in that fishbowl analogy, it's simply social etiquette. That's it. It's a biological delusion to help us survive as a species. If we're merely evolved primates on a speck of dust in this infinite universe, 
What possible reason is there not to murder everyone who gets in the way of our survival? It happens all the time in the animal kingdom. Just as Bill Craig says, when a lion kills a gazelle, it doesn't murder the gazelle. It kills the gazelle and eats it. It doesn't murder it. When I kill another human being, I'm murdering. And of course, the murder is something with ill intent, right? There's spite in me that's, that's different. Um, animals, you know, a lion can forcefully copulate with a lioness. It forces itself upon her, has sex, they have babies. Then a lion, if it conquers, it will kill all the other little baby cubs that came from a different lion father. So his gene pool can carry on. When I try to do that, they put me in prison. It's called rape. It's never worked. Just a joke. But it's rape. Just because my kids are here. It's rape. They won't, they won't say, no, 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 no. It's perfectly natural. It happens in the animal kingdom all the time. And he's just trying to make sure his seed lives on. No one would do that. I'm morally to blame. Lions are not morally to blame because we understand there's a moral law and we don't think other animals do that. So remember, morality is not what we do, it's what we ought to do. And you can never, ever, ever get an ought from an is. That's why the moral law can't come from the natural realm. You can't get it that way. There's no, if a tree falls down, boom, or the snow knocks a power line down, power line's there, I'll go, you ought not be there. You ought to feel guilty for yourself. No, 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 it's just, it's what happened. The laws of physics, the weight pulled down, that's what happened. That's how morality cannot come, even if evolution's true, it can't come from that. You cannot get an ought from an is. That's a very old naturalistic fallacy from, from the 18th century, by the way, but that's the easy way of saying it. You can't get an ought from an is. So someone says, oh, you know, it comes from evolution. You can't get an ought from an is. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. So, in naturalism, there is no oughtness whatsoever. I think God is the best explanation for why we feel the sense of oughtness, or rather you might say it's a command, and that's why we call it a, a commandment. We often call this the divine command theory, that where we get value from, the value to be honest, uh, you know, fair play, justice, on and on, loving, all these kind of values, and the moral duty is what we ought to do in that moment. And I'm a Christian theist. I think God's the best explanation. I think objective moral values come from God. Much like a radio, an old school radio. Kids used to be radios. You turned the dial and there was a little antenna on it. And it, picked, and it picked up radio signal. Kind of like a Bluetooth signal. Anyway, you would turn the dial and like, and then you hear the music playing. Well, and my view is that that's exactly what happens in the human person, in the soul. We've got like this moral radio that God picks up on God's tune. But that some people don't have perfect tuning, right? No, we don't. We don't have perfect tuning. That's right. Uh, but that's the case. Now, I, I'm going to say more here in just a second. Uh, but I say a lot more about number seven. And, of course, it's online. I'll probably do it here eventually. But it's on my YouTube channel. So if you go to David Pendergrass on YouTube or David Pendergrass Ministries, I've got a three or four part series on morality. And I really unpack this a lot and go through all the objections I've heard and so forth. I'm not doing that, obviously, now because of time, but it's just an overview. Um, most materialists or naturalists today, these days, they believe that humans are a safe source for this. We are the source of morality. Uh, like Sam Harris. Have you heard of Sam Harris? He's a well-known atheist. He's written books against Christianity. Uh, he'll say this all the time. Humans, we should get a bunch of really good, rational people together in one room and determine our moral values and duties. Now, that's a fundamental difference between Christians and naturalists. Christians admit that humans are not and cannot ever be the source of the good. Ever. Because Sam Harris, being a naturalist, is also evolutionist, think we just evolved from earlier species of primates and on and on and on. All of it is a natural process. It's just all matter and energy. You don't get an ought from it is. It can't happen that way. And being rational doesn't help me at all. It doesn't help me at all. So I say a lot more about that, but I do think these exist. Uh, evolution doesn't help us. Naturalism doesn't help us. It's a sense of oughtness that across the globe we do it. Now, some might say, yeah, David, but some people have to be taught. You have to be taught sometimes not to steal. That's true. And C.S. Lewis talks about all this in Mere Christianity perfectly. Uh, I'm also taught arithmetic. I was taught in school that two times two equals four. I was taught that, instructed that. That doesn't mean because it was taught, therefore it's really subjective. 
It's not two times two equals whatever you want it to be. But my teacher is very power hungry. She just forced it down my throat. Around the globe, people have realized, no, that's true. It's just a, it's, it's a fact of the universe. Two times two really equals four nets. That makes sense. Two plus two uh, equals, I mean, you just, you know, that makes sense. That's exactly how it is. I discover that. I discover it. Just because I'm taught morality doesn't make it subjective. Just like mathematics. It doesn't. Now, what's happening is it's become more and more popular to get around this is you become what they call moral Platonist. A Plato believe that um, there are objective moral values and duties. They exist. They're just, they, they're out there. And they exist necessarily. And they supervene on events. They're just kind of like floating realities. That's a small group of philosophers. You can believe that. I don't find it convincing. Most, most Christians are not Platonist. Uh, because my question, my question always back is, these floating out their moral values and duties, why do they tell me what I ought to do? Why do I feel that kind of, as he said, that weight upon me to do the right thing? And what do I blame for other people that don't do it right? Where does that come from? Moral commandments, moral values and duties feel like a commandment, I think, because it comes from a commander. You should do it, you ought to do it, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to pause it for a second. Any more questions about that, comments? What's the best way to, if you're just talking to somebody and they bring that up, what's the best thing to say to that? To if they bring up what? The, the kind of, not the Platonism, but the kind of morality is kind of, it just is a defense mechanism almost, like the evolutionism kind of idea. Yeah, so the typical one, by the way, what time is it? How are we doing? 7.04. That's all good, 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 because I wanted to finish this one section for tonight. Uh, 7.08. We're almost there. Uh, if someone says, and this is very, very common, that, yeah, sure, there are such things as morality, it comes because we're, as a species, it's called, what Lewis will call, and others call, a herd instinct. It's a herd instinct. Like herd, like animals might have herd, they sense the sound, they do things together, and so forth. Uh, the problem with this, that's not morality. Instincts, Lewis gives the perfect analogy. Uh, if you call a moral value or the duty, what, what key to push? Just like, think of a keyboard, okay? Sorry, I'm thinking of many things and thinking too fast. If you think of a keyboard where there's white and black keys, right? Those keys are, we'll say, the instincts. Which one do I push? Which one should I push? The music tells me what to play. Lewis, by analogy, says the music is the moral law. It tells me which one I ought to do. Her instinct doesn't tell me. Her instinct is an instinct, sure. It doesn't tell me what I ought to do. It doesn't tell me what I ought to do. If, see, it's hard to tell this because humans don't have the exact same way. If a pack animal, we have dogs, and their instinct tells them there's a noise, look up, bark. They're not morally to blame or moral praise. There's no moral oughtness to whether or not their brain tells them to respond to the noise. Dogs aren't been done the right thing by doing what their instincts make them to do. They've been done the wrong thing if they don't bark. They just follow their instincts. If morality is just human herd instincts, then we are delusional about morality. Morality cannot mean that. Because most people in the history of the human race have never meant that when they say morality. They don't think it's what they do, it's what they should do. That's what Lewis's point is, what they should do, what they ought do. So if a person says it's nothing but evolution, they don't understand what morality is. It's nothing but the herd instinct. If it's nothing but the herd instinct, they don't know what morality is. They, they just do not understand at all what morality is. And we're not going to get to that in the video tonight probably. Um, it's going to turn on in a second. They're, they don't understand what the instinct is. So there's several things I'd say is one is they don't understand what morality is. Two, I would also say that, back to that is all fallacy. If we are just evolved primates on a speck of dust, you can't tell me what I ought to do based on what is. You can't tell, that doesn't make any sense. Logically, it doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. And then if they don't get that, I go back to analogies. Again, if a lion kills a gazelle, he's not murdered it. He's just doing what his instincts tell him to do. But that's not what humans do. Humans, don't, humans are different. If a human does that, everybody besides a psychopath and sociopath said, you shouldn't have done that. There's something else in us that they do not experience, that we do experience, the moral law, that tells me what I ought to do. And to prove it, 
one of the proofs that we have about it is a feeling when we did not do the thing we should have done. And we have a word for that in English, it's guilt. As far as we know, no other animal on the planet, no other species feels guilt or compulsion, uh, compunction. Guilt only makes sense in, that, in the way I'm using it, in the sense of if there's something, quote, above me or beyond me that is telling me what I should do. I'm breaking a rule. And that's Lewis's point. When someone says, why did you do that? We don't say, why are you asking such a stupid question? I can do what I want to do. We're just evolved chimps. No one does that. No one does that. What they say is, it's because they give an excuse for their behavior because they know we're both appealing to a moral law. And I'm excusing my behavior while, while I'm excusing why I'm not in the wrong and why you're wrong to think I'm in the wrong. But we both agree there's a right and a wrong. But animals don't do that. Evolution, that's what, chimps don't do that as far as we know. We can't what if somebody said, well, if my dog goes potty on the carpet and I fuss at him, he puts his head down and goes away like he's guilty. Yeah, so if a dog looks, looks like he's, uh, he or she was guilty, like poops on the ground or whatever, that's right. First, I would say two things. One is we still don't know that's morality. We don't know they're feeling the moral law. It can be just as much the case that the dogs know that what's happened last time is I got punished. I get punished for it. And so their instinct tells them, just like Pavlovian responses, my mouth starts watering when I hear the bell, remember Pavlov and his dog. So it could be the exact same. Last time my bottom got pumped, uh, popped or I got put in the cage and oh no, I know it's coming. That's my response. That, that's, I can make that, I mean a lot of times I think it's exactly what happens. However, let's go to more of the higher primates like chimpanzees and so forth. They do, some of the, the way they treat each other seems to demonstrate that. The problem with higher species, the, the problem is we can't communicate with them. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So if aliens came, and Lewis says this too, if aliens came and watched human beings, they would not be able to determine what we ought to do. They can only determine what we do. They might try to infer. It looks like they think they ought to do X, Y, but we're not sure. Let's assume they can't communicate with us. So just watching our behavior. The only way to know for sure that we feel the moral law is by communicating with us or being a human. The exact same true with animals. That's the only way to know for sure. And what happens, what I have found is evolutionists, particularly when they go to higher primates, when they watch their behavior, since they're convinced we're higher primates, then they have to, they, uh, they anthropomorphize. They put them as like they're human. See, look, that's just like us, it's just like us. When you don't have that assumption, I don't care about evolution or not, we just realize, wait a second, wait, that's not just like us, we're watching behavior. We don't know exactly why they did it because we can't communicate with them. That's the big problem is we can't, we're not a chimp and we can't communicate with chimps like that in the same way. <coughs> My last thing about that is this, even if the chimps did do it for some moral law, what that demonstrates is the transcendence of the moral law. That is, it's so powerful that as soon as a human's uh, uh, the brain or soul's capacity gets even more and more human-like and then more angelic-like and more God-like, the more our radio gets in tune with it. It would not, that's it. It, wouldn't, it would not demonstrate that it comes from evolution. It cannot do that. You can't get an ought from an is. That boundary will never be broken. It's a logical fallacy. Yeah, Julia? You're asking the same question? You're so smart. Yeah, do you want me to fix your camera? Because you're not cutting off the, your eyes. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Fix it. I'm going to say this last thing and we'll be done for tonight. Because you're doing such good listeners. There's one video I want to show you, though, but I might need to get my power cord. We'll see if I can get to it. I might wrap up next time. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Oh, you got it? 17. Kind of. Do you want to get my power cord then? It's in my office. Because I think we can wrap up on this. Are you with me so far? Are you okay doing this stop? Yeah? Mm -hmm. You good? I think Julie's struggling. You think Julie's struggling? Okay. The number one thing people say, okay, oh, I said divine command theory. You remember me saying those words, divine command theory? That's not the only Christian view, but it's the most dominant. It's my view that our moral values and duties come from God, as it were, commanding it amongst the human race. Okay. Does that mean we can all apprehend it? No, some of us have disorders. Some of us can't do mathematics. It's called uh, dyscalculia. That is, I can't do mathematical equations. That doesn't mean mathematics doesn't exist. Doesn't mean mathematics is subjective. It just means some of us can't grasp it well. Some of us are colorblind. So there is a such thing as that God gives that and then we have different ways of apprehending it. So we have to teach it to others? Yes, we can. It's still objective. It doesn't make it subjective and so forth. Okay, 
Every single atheist you ever talk to who's read a little bit or watched YouTube videos, they're going to say, yeah, 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 what about Euthyphro? Good old Euthyphro. And if you know Euthyphro, he's your friend. Thank you, babe. Um, then you, you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, you got it? Uh, have you ever heard of this before, Euthyphro's Dilemma? No. No. Well, how about that? I can teach you something. Okay. Euthyphro, Euthyphro. Uh, Euthyphro... I won't spend long on this. You can read all kinds of literature if you want on this. Uh, Plato, Plato, the good old philosopher, Greek philosopher, um, he wrote a dialogue, a pretend dialogue, okay? And Euthyphro uh, tries to explain to Socrates that piety, doing the right thing, good thing, according to the gods, is what the gods love. Piety is what the gods love. So that's, we should be the word pious. We should do what the gods love. Socrates then asked Euthyphro, Here's the question for you. Now I'm paraphrasing, but this is the question. Whether the gods love the pious because they're good, or whether the pious are good because the gods love them. That is, is something moral good because God wills it, or does God will it because it's good? That's Euthyphro's dilemma, as they call it. Is something moral good because God wills it, or does God will it because it's good? Now, this is why it's a dilemma as it's so explained. If it's the first option that something's moral is good because God wills it, it means it's arbitrary. That is, God could will something different all the time. It's wrong to right now, but tonight it could be good and tomorrow it could be bad again. As long as God just, he can just arbitrarily change his mind. If that's true, then it's arbitrary, which means it's not really the moral law as we understand it. If it's the second, that it's God wills it because it's good. That means something is good above and beyond God himself, which A, doesn't answer the question of where morality comes from, and two, it doesn't match the typical theistic definition of God, because they say God is the center of that. That's the typical dilemma, and most of the time, in trillions of YouTube videos, the atheist is gonna drop the mic. Skadoosh, it's over. You're welcome, all your morality is all dumb, and it's all ridiculous, and you should never brought it up. Uh, this is the, their response to divine command theory. Now, it's sad because this has been debunked for a long time, but it's still, again, like so many things on YouTube, it's just, it lives forever and ever and ever, like my son's original videos. Uh, now, let me say very quickly about one more response. The dilemma is a problem only if you adopt something called volunteerism rather than essentialism. Here it is. Volunteerism is that values, moral values, come from his will. Essentialism is a view that moral values come from God's character. So volunteerism seems to make moral values arbitrary. Sure, God could will certain behaviors randomly, arbitrarily, like raping is good. Sure he could. But essentialism argues, which is what I am and most Christians are, that, that moral values come from God's very character. His essential moral properties, the good, flows from his nature or character. God is by nature essentially good, loving, kind, faithful, just, loyal, truthful, etc. God's nature and character is the standard of the morality of an action. These properties are good because God possesses them. They're descriptions of the way God is, and therefore these are goods. Those aren't arbitrary. They can't be changed. They cannot be changed. They're essential to God's character. Those are logically necessary and therefore exist in all possible worlds. There is no possible world in which God lacks these properties and does not exist. So why obey God? Well, because of his authority. So that's it. So if someone says, well, it's from God's very character, it could have been different. No, it couldn't have. God is a, in Christian theism, and any kind of theism, God is a necessary being. Back to number one. Remember the universe either necessarily exists, do you remember that? Or it's contingent. God is a necessary being. You can't get God in a different way. God, by definition, by nature, is good, loving, faithful, just, all. These are moral values that flow right out of his character. So, well, they can be different. No, they can't. They can't. What do you do with Old Testament God telling 
people to go wipe out a whole group of people and kill mm -hmm. them all. And then in the New Testament, you're not supposed to murder. I mean, even back then. Good question. Yeah, that's it. That's that a, sounds like a change. That's the typical right? atheist response. Thank that's you, honey. Why I asked it. That's right. So, what about God in the Old Testament? It goes to go kill those people. The New Testament says, "Do not murder." I talk a lot about that in the YouTube videos. We talk. I, if you watch, you watch my moral value mm -hmm. discussion on that. But for those um, who haven't watched it, the Old Testament commandments to go eradicate the people can be understood in two major ways, and, and I talk about all this. There's tons of literature on it. But the main one is God wants to push the people, the Canaanites, out of the land. The commandments are not to slaughter people because he hates Canaanites, or he's a racist, or he wants genocide. It's to push them out of the land because every single ancient person, Egyptian, Canaanite, Jewish, everybody believed that gods had imminent domain. Everybody believed that about their gods. This is my land. Until my God, no, God says my land. No, God says my land. And so my God has the right to tell you to get off of his land. They said, no, my God said this is his land. Everyone thought that, including the Jews. So we read through the Judges, the book of Judges, which primarily talks about them driving the people off the land, is predicated on an assumption in their worldview that God said this is my land, get off. So if they said, I'm getting off the land, they don't get killed. But instead, they find resistance, 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 to which God says, then make them get off. And all people thought that about their gods. The other way also that's a corollary to that is that, and this is a standard view, it's not the only view, it's not the only view, but it's a standard view in Christian thought, that is, depending on the, how you interpret these verses, that, God, that God's pushing them off the land and possible fighting them is a form of judgment because they were such horrible sinners. It is not, according to the biblical text, Jews saying, I hate those blanks because they're a bunch of racists, and he's going to kill people at random. Their view in the, that book is that God has commanded them to basically be his judgment upon them. Again, by driving them out or possibly even killing them. That has nothing to do with the commandment uh, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, that says do not murder. Which, of course, is the same commandment Jesus cites in the Gospels. It has nothing to do with that. It is not do not kill. Every translation you see is wrong. If it says that, it's not do not kill. It's a different Hebrew word and a Greek word. Do not murder. Murder, of course, means to kill someone with the intent of hatred or spite in your heart. I'm in such rage, I go to the place, I'm trying to kill you because I'm so angry. That's not the Old Testament view. Old New Testament view is that that's wrong. It's always wrong. That's all condemnable. Boom. So that, that idea is not at all the same as God's commandment to have the Israelites drive away people off the land. Good question. Just completely irrelevant. I'm just kidding. No, it's a good question. <laughs> so, if you're a volunteerist, this is arbitrary. Yeah, I get it. That's okay. I'm not. And most Christians are not. We think God's moral value, his character flows. This is an analogy. It's not exactly the same. It's not. I know. But I know Elaine so well that I know for a fact what flows out of her Diet is Diet Coke. If you cut her, <laughs> Diet Coke will come out. Chocolate from the other arm. I know if I go to a drink and I say, what kind of drinks you got here? If Diet Coke's on the menu, I, be, I would bet I have no savings. My house, that she would Diet Coke because it flows. I know that's her behavior. Or, or better yet, of course, that's a silly analogy. The better, close analogy I really was going to make was, I know Elaine is tenderhearted. I know she's tenderhearted. I know, I've been around her long enough to know she's very, very, very tenderhearted. She's been that way since my parents told me from <coughs> almost birth. She's very kind. So whenever she says to the kids, you ought to be kind, and someone says, why did your mom tell you to do that? And you say, it's arbitrary. Sometimes she's a horrible tyrant punk, but today she said, be kind. Anybody who knows Elaine would go, that's just silly. That's just silly. That's who Elaine is. Of course she told her kids to be kind and tenderhearted because that's who she is. It's like that with God, but perfect. Elaine's a contingent being. She came here because she, her parents gave birth to her. God had no parents. God's character is fixed and set. There will never be a time, therefore, when God tells Will to go kill people. The God who exists would never tell anybody that it's good to be hateful. It's, today's good to go rape. Won't happen. He'll never change his mind like that because he's essential to his character. Euthyphro's dilemma is completely irrelevant in Christian theism. It's not this either or nonsense. It comes out of it. 
So I see moral duties, what we ought to do, as rooted in the commandments, or that is the moral value in the commandments, what God tells us to do. Moral values are rooted in the nature of God. So does God have duties? Does God have things he should do and ought to do? What do you think? Seven to, oh, oh, you're good. We're almost done. Does God have duties? And the, and the divine command theory, the answer is well, yes and no. What only, not from other beings, if God issues duties to himself, then yes, he does have a moral duty. Like, like if God says, I will protect you, Will, or the ancient Israelites. If he said, I will do something, well, now he's got to do it. Because he's the source of authority. But God does not have the moral duties that humans have. That's worth a whole lecture right there because so many people I've met who were so mad at God. Where was he? Is he not good? Now I talk about this in that class on YouTube. You can watch it. God does not have the moral duties you and I have because no one's given them to God. He's given them to us. The analogy I've given before when I did the boundaries classes, you know, if someone comes up and says, why didn't you wash my, why is my car dirty? Why? Because you got the dirt, snow. Or why didn't you wash it? It's not my car. You should take care of my stuff. No, you should take care of your stuff. But we're both humans. We have the exact same moral duty. No, we don't. It depends on our office. You're in the office of owner of your car. Take care of your own business. Who, why didn't you feed my children? Because I'm not their parent. You're in the office of parent. I have my own kids. God is in the office of God. He does not have our moral duties. Just because God tells you and me to go feed the homeless does not mean God is on a moral imperative to go feed the homeless. God is under no moral obligation. He doesn't have to feed anybody. He doesn't have to. We might want to find a cure to cancer. It's a good thing for us to ought to relieve suffering as much as possible. We're under that moral, we have the moral duty to do that. God is not on that moral duty. Every single second God does anything good for anybody, he does it because he just wanted to do it. He didn't ought to. So every time we get mad at God, and we do, every time we have that childish response of, why didn't he do X, Y, Z? He should have. Pause for one second in your anger and rage and go, should he have though? Based on what? What God told him to do that? Is he being a rebellious child? No. He's the source of all goodness. So whatever we're arguing against God is just completely wrong. Now, I'll say this quick quick video, and, and we're done. Uh, is that okay so far? If you have more questions, more comments, more whatever, please watch my moral uh, discussion. Okay, this I thought was really cool. I'm a nerd. Okay, but stay with me. This is just really cool. Um, in the 2018 Isaac Asimov Memorial Debate, they talked about artificial intelligence. Okay, and in this, they had some brilliant people, IBM, geniuses, Neil deGrasse Tyson, You've seen him before. He's a black scientist. I say he's black because he is. He's which stands out scientist. He's on NBC, ABC, blah blah. See, and he's always talking about you know global warming or this or that. Smart guy. Seemed like a nice guy. Nerd all out. And he's the main host. And this is a regular bunch of nerds sitting around tables going, "What will be artificial intelligence like?" And if you know, years ago when they started having like a, a course like Isaac Asimov started pretending if we develop robots and what if they became conscious, then what would happen? And so he made up rules uh, that to this day are actually still the bedrock of artificial intelligence. That is, the, remember the rules of robots? Have you ever seen the Will Smith movie, iRobot? All these kind of sci-fi, they always have the same stuff. They say no robot, robot can hurt another human. Robin Williams. Robin Williams, the centennial man, bicentennial man. So it's always the same. That comes way, way back. That's a very, very old fiction thing that robots can hurt other humans. Uh, they can't hurt themselves. I mean, it has a, the point is they can't harm people. Okay, in this debate that I, I mean, it's, it's not a debate, it's just a discussion. I thought this was so cool. Okay, in this... Hi is, everybody, I'm... Uh, that's Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the Frederick P. Rose director. The guy's a real bright guy. So he's talking to these people about... Hold on one second. Do they know that? Let me back up. It is at... 3850. 30. Yeah, hold on one second. Three so the danger is that they would be... Here it is, okay. So what was so cool about it was... Now these are... <laughs> these are probably... I know he's an atheist. I know DeGrasse Tyson is. I know he's an atheist. He, 
He thinks God can't exist because there's suffering in the world. That's what he thinks. That's a bad argument. It's a very bad argument. But it's very common. That's fair. It's very common. It's a very bad argument. But that's, he'll say that over and over. People ask him, do you believe in God? Well, I look at all the disease in the world and blah, blah, blah. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't follow at all. Disease doesn't mean God doesn't exist. But anyway, he asked the question, and we're talking morality. This all fits. He asked the question of, this guy's about to ask him, what about, we want, we want robots to be ethical, right? Because what about a robot who has to decide, or it's an automatic car, and he has to decide, a, a kid jumps in the street, but if it veers off, the 10 people in the bus will all die versus the one kid. What do they decide? How do you teach these robots how to make ethical decisions? Because artificial intelligence is going to do it anyway. Now, what I thought was so fascinating was, I thought surely they're about to say, it doesn't matter. It's going to evolve. Conscious will take over. We all have experienced it anyway, right? Look at all around us. We made it. We don't need any higher Just a bunch of rational people ought to get in a room. And the robots will decide for that. That's not what he says at all. Listen to what he says needs to happen to put morality inside these robots. And what role AI can play in assisting our reasoning there. So probably many of you have heard about trolley problems. This, was, this became popular um, uh, in psychology to pose ethical dilemmas to people and see uh, how they react. And the, 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 there's many variations of it, but the standard kind of story is a trolley is going down a track and it's about to hit uh, or kill three people, and then you notice that there's a switch, and you could make it go over to another track where there's only one person, and you could choose to kill that other person instead of the first three. Would you do it? And I. I wait, wait, so, so, the, ja so the, the dilemma there is somebody's going to die no matter what. You either can not touch it, then the trolley kills three people on its own, or you can intervene and actively kill one person. Right. Now, right. I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I think it, it, it seems to be a kind of silly question to ask people because humans can really never get, I think, into a mental state where they can really believe that with certainty, if this action, ha if I take this action, I'll kill this one person for sure, and the other action. There's always this uncertainty, there's always questions about what the blame was. It's, it, it's not actually a realistic situation. Um, so the question is, will AIs actually maybe, was it more realistic for them perhaps? Uh, could a, an autonomous vehicle be in a situation where uh, all of a sudden a bicyclist runs in front of it and has a chance to swerve and, and, and do some other damage, and will it have to weigh that? You would have to take out the vegetable cart first, <laughs> then find out what else it does. Yeah, and you know, so, so will they have to be coded in them what the solutions are to those dilemmas? You know, when it does happen... Right, right. So yeah. that implies that humans get together, figure out a solution, and you hand it to AI. That's not the point of AI. The AI is going to have some higher intelligence than we do, and that's why I'm curious. So, so, so I'm actually an AI to that problem. Is it going to give different answers than we would? And then we said, oh my gosh, we never thought about it that way. Let's do it that way. So I think this is where it's going in some of the discussion here. Uh, actually, no, AI, which, the idea is we want to give different, for the humans to give AI the values. And the AI is, is concerned with making decisions and taking actions to promote those values. So ultimately, we are saying, you know, we value life. We value that. That's that's part of what the robot laws are for. So are those robot laws? They are science fiction. Yeah, you know, you know, no, 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 no. But it's, it's because, because so the danger is that they would be weaponized by the party that is programming them and is is controlling them. Not that they're going to all of a sudden decide to uh, get rid of the humans. That's you know, that's not the source of the danger. For, you know, with respect to the, the kind of trolley problem situation in, in this hypothetical autonomous vehicle, when it does happen that a car, one of these cars runs over a bicyclist, then it'll happen, I, I think, much less frequently than humans do it today. Um, we'll take the black box. I hope they're engineers that they have a black box that captures everything that was in their senses all the time and it's very secure so they can't lie about it. And then we'll be able to dissect it and we'll say, you know, you made this decision, why did you do that? And you, say, you might say, well, I, I hit the bicycle because if I swerved to the left, I would have run over, uh, you know, a, a child. Or, or if it said, well, I did that because uh, if, I, if I swerved too fast, I'd wake up the passenger. Then you'd say, no, that was the wrong decision. That was not what we, that was not what we meant for you to, for you to do. It, 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 it's still better than what the test was said. Yeah, don't wake me up for any reason. <laughs> That's right. And it's the robot's job to obey me. Exactly. It's exactly an answer. That, that, so this is part of the nature of AI, is that the unintended consequence of the specification of the values won't hit what you really care about. 
Uh, let me ask Google and IBM here. Uh, in your efforts, in, in this, I don't want to call it a race, but let's call it a, a um, exploration, uh, is there a tandem sort of ethical group? Oh, yeah. At, uh, let me start over here at IBM. He goes on and talks about, do you have ethical assistance at IBM? And he goes, yeah, we do. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm done. Did you, did you grasp what he was saying? You're like, oh, yeah, I got it, I got it. Now, when she's saying there are no laws at science fiction, that's what I was just talking about. He's saying the first law is robots don't hurt other people. That's the fictional idea. But he's saying, no, no, no. We're going to put moral values in them. Mm -hmm. And if they're conscious, they'll do what they do with those values. And he says, but if they go, because they didn't wake up the character, we'll say, no, that was wrong. What's a biblical word Sin. for saying that was wrong to do that? Sin. Sin. We're saying it's wrong. Oh, condemn, judge. Judge. Mm -hmm. That sounds like something I've read in the <laughs> Bible. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, in my view, exact, he has perfectly described the divine command theory. God has placed inside the human conscious, the human mind, the, the moral values he wanted to put there. And boy, I hope it go in the wrong hands. Remember hear that? The wrong hands. That's what's happened. We're the wrong hands. But we still apprehend those moral values, but we keep not doing the thing we know we ought to do. And there'll be judgment for it. And God will look at our black box in the world to come and go, I put those moral values in there. Why did you stop? It? Why did you run over that? Why did you do that? And it'll be exposed. He said, I'll have a black box. You can't lie. It'll be all of a sudden. That, that's the Christian worldview. That's the Christian worldview. Anyway, I thought that was a very good, completely non-religious, mm -hmm. nerdy explanation of what I've been saying the whole time, which is that's my view of what's happened now. And they're saying the best minds are, that's how we want to make artificial intelligence. And I'm saying that's exactly what God has done right now in intelligence. That's it. Not just in, because intelligent, but because of rational people. Anyway, I hope that helps. Maybe it doesn't. Any questions or comments about that? No? You want to make a robot? Mm -hmm. I'll say a quick prayer for us. Thank you, God, very much for allowing us to learn again. Help us as we go out of this room tonight. Uh, of course, appreciate you more, know more of you, and be more confident to talk to people about how so much about our existence points to you. That we have a reason to be confident uh, that you are real and that your moral law, of course, is inside us. And even though we break it, we know that we can talk to almost any other human being and assume the same thing about them. Uh, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to do that with other people. Help us speak clearly about your love uh, and what you, how you've changed our lives. And to the glory of Jesus, we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen.